Can we say thank you to Pastor Angie? I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. Um, first, I want to just speak to this gentleman right here. Uh, yeah, what, what's your name? You. Yeah. Mark. Mark? I, you were just highlighted to me during worship, and I just, I feel like the Lord has, has done many wonderful things for you. Um, I just kind of saw like this, like an exodus, like a pulling out of darkness into light, and this just God has done many things for you. And I just, I just feel like the Lord's hand is on your life, that he's been doing many wonderful things, and I just feel like he wants to encourage you to, kind of like Moses, keep your hands up, because he's still fighting battles for you, and there's still breakthroughs for you that the Lord is doing, and the things that he has done, he'll do again and continue to do. Amen? Yeah. Bless you. Amen. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We have Bibles. All right. Well, before we begin, I want to share a joke with you. Can I read a joke to you? Yeah. You know, the Bible says that uh, laughter uh, is good like medicine. A merry, a merry heart does good like medicine. Okay, you ready? A popular Catholic priest was celebrating his 25th anniversary of ministry in a particular town. A large crowd came to, to the banquet to honor him. In his address, he said, when I first came to this town 25 years ago, I was shocked because the first person who came to me for confession told me of a series of terrible sins of immorality, corruption, cheating, lying, and I wondered what kind of people were living in this town. But as the years passed, went by, I found that the people here are wonderful, upright, and generous people. I love this town and hope to stay here a long while. After he finished, the chief guest, the mayor of the town arrived. When he took the platform, he said, I'm very sorry to be late, but some urgent manners delayed me at the last moment. The priest and I have been good friends for 25 years. In fact, when he arrived 25 years ago, I was the first person to go to him to confess my sins. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I wanted to share it. Well, let's jump into the word today, amen? So if you put your hand on your heart and pray with me, say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart of understanding in Jesus' name. All right, well, this morning, uh, we are celebrating something called Pentecost. Anyone know, know about Pentecost? Come on. So that means that it's been uh, 50 days since Passover, right? How many of you celebrated Good Friday? Remember Easter Sunday? Celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? Well, let's dive into this because Pentecost is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And primarily, um, <clears throat> the most important aspect of Pentecost, especially for us as believers in Jesus, is the coming of the Spirit of God. How many of you know we need the Holy Spirit? I love the statement that, you know, so many have said, uh, I say it too, but if, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? If Jesus himself didn't start his ministry until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need the Spirit of God? I'll even go this far. Jesus didn't go into the wilderness to face temptation until he was baptized in the Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to overcome temptation. We need the Spirit of God to overcome the enemy. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen? If we don't have the Spirit, then we can't walk in the Spirit. We can't live by the Spirit. Right? Right? We'll just walk in the flesh. We need the Spirit. Amen? So let's, let's just jump into this. I have a lot of notes. We'll, uh, we'll see where we land, or how, how we get to everywhere that we're going. Amen? Um, Pentecost is very significant to the message of the kingdom. 
How many of you have heard us preach about the gospel of the kingdom? It's the, the gospel, it's the only gospel in the Bible. It's the gospel Jesus preached. It was the central theme of Jesus' message. He, he, his favorite subject was the kingdom. He's always talking about the kingdom. And so um, I'll, I'll just start with some of my notes here. Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He also taught the disciples in Luke 24 to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 17, Jesus said that the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation for the kingdom is within us. And in Matthew 12, 28, that if the Holy Spirit comes upon us, then the kingdom has come upon us. If the Holy Spirit, he said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So there's a connection between the Spirit of God and the kingdom of God. In Romans 14, verse 17, Paul said that the kingdom is not a matter of, of eating and drinking. It's not what you eat or don't. He said it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, Paul said the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. The kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. You know the interesting thing with that? The Greek word for words there is logos. If you know what that means, it's the same word used in John 1 that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Logos. It's the, it's the word most used for the written word of God. The, the kingdom of God is not a matter of logos, but dunamis. Dunamis is the Greek word power. It's actually where we get the word dynamite from. Dunamis. Anyone want some dunamis? <laughs> so Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. You'll receive dunamis. Come on, somebody. Okay, so who, 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 who needs the Spirit? Who needs power? Come on. Okay. So to seek the kingdom implies also that we're going to seek the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, the implication is, is so that you find it. <laughs> Whenever, whatever you seek, you Whatever you ask for, whenever you knock, it will be. So if Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, he's, he's implying that it's so that you can discover it, so that you can find it. And if the kingdom is not a matter of words, but power, then to align yourself with the kingdom of God will activate the power of the kingdom. In fact, let's dive into this word dunamis. The, the Strong's Concordance defines it as a spiritual force, miraculous power, supernatural ability. Say, that's for me. It's a force. I, I want to I propose to you that the Holy Spirit is the greatest power in existence. How many of you know there are forces of darkness? There are principalities and powers but the Holy Spirit is a greater power than any other power the Holy Spirit is a, a greater force than any other force and, and for the record he's not just a force he's a person amen but if he if he pushes on you how many of you know he can release a force if a linebacker takes out a quarterback there's a force but it came from a person amen the Holy Spirit is a person, but with the Spirit comes power, and that power is a spiritual force. It's a supernatural ability, miraculous power. Who wants miraculous power? Say, that's for me. It means abundance, strength, might. It even is defined as violence. I find that interesting because the definition for violence is a behavior involving a physical force intended to hurt, damage, or, or destroy. Now, why is that significant? Jesus, come on, somebody. Got baptized. 
That's what I'm talking about. Jesus said the kingdom of God suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. And it says that Jesus came to what? To destroy the works of the devil. We want to release violence on the kingdom of darkness. So the spirit of God comes upon us. He gives us power to overthrow the kingdom of darkness, thus advancing the kingdom of light until all current and prior enemy occupied territories have been subdued and filled with light, which is the rule and the reign of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Strong's continues to define this as a strength ability or, I love this, inherent power residing in something by virtue of its nature. Dunamis is the inherent power residing in something by virtue of its nature. So to activate the power of the kingdom, we have to align ourselves with the nature of the kingdom. If the power of something is resident in it by virtue of its nature, then to unleash its nature will activate its power. So how do we align ourselves with the kingdom? Well, we have to discover the nature of the kingdom. What, what's probably the, the, the first and foremost, what is, what's the nature of the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God is light. That's why it's the kingdom of light, meaning there is no darkness in it. There's, there's no shadow. You know, in heaven, there are no shadows because he is everywhere shining at once. There is no darkness. It is light. Everything is light. Everything radiates light because he fills everything there. So, so to align ourselves with the kingdom, first and foremost, we have to walk in the light. And when we do that, what does that do? It says that then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So the power of the kingdom to conquer sin and death is unleashed when we align ourselves with the, the kingdom of light by walking in the light. Does that make sense? Another aspect of the nature of the kingdom is that it's true, meaning it's filled with truth. There, there is no lies, deceit, or deception in the kingdom. There are, there are no lies. You can't even lie in the kingdom. <laughs> That's why the Bible says that God cannot lie. It's impossible that he would lie. Does that make sense? I think that's probably why on Judgment Day, I just, I just think that people are not going to be able to fabricate a story when they stand before him. Like you're not going to stand in the presence of God on Judgment Day to give an account of your life and say anything that wasn't true. I think people will be shocked by the things they confess to him on Judgment Day. They'll be like, oh, snap. <laughs> You're not going to be able to be like, well, I, I really, you know, if you just like blatantly don't care about people and you just walk over people or disrespect people and you're like, well, I really loved them. You're not going to be able to say that on judgment day if you didn't, right? Because you're not going to be able to lie in his presence. There is no, there is no deceit in his presence. There's no darkness. Okay. So The nature of the kingdom is that, first and foremost, it's the most influential thing in all of creation. There is nothing that it cannot touch or influence. It affects everything, and it has no limitations. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened, meaning you can, you can take the smallest measure of the kingdom and put it in one of the greatest things in, in it will affect, it, by virtue of its nature, it will begin to affect the whole, the whole of it. All of it will be, come under the influence. And you know what's amazing about leaven? We're going to talk a little bit more about leaven. Um, leaven is activated by heat. If you put, any bakers in here? You ever put yeast in, you know, you're making bread or, or dough or something, you put yeast in it. If you put it in the freezer, will that dough rise? No, why? Because leaven needs heat. 
Now, if you set it over, you know, your wood stove, it's probably going to overflow, right? Because that dough's going to expand. Heat activates leaven. And whatever leaven that we have in us will be revealed by the fires that we walk through. If we have the leaven of the kingdom, then the hotter it gets or the darker it gets, the brighter we should shine. But if we continue to have the leaven of the world, of, 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 of you know, religion or whatever it is, then if we go into darkness, if we go into trials, then that's what's going to begin to manifest. That's what's going to come out. Does that make sense? Okay. So we need the kingdom leaven, which, uh, spoiler alert, the kingdom leaven is the spirit of God. Hallelujah. So we need to seek first the kingdom because in the seeking we find and when we find, the result is power. Dunamis. So, let's look at this. Go to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. There's, there's seven different... Uh, of festivals, so to speak, that are mentioned here. Uh, they call them holy convocations. A convocation's a gathering, an assembling. It's a holy assembly. There's three of them that, that Israel was to do uh, annually every year where the whole nation was to travel to Jerusalem and to do it all together as one. The first one that we read is the Passover, which how many of you know, 50 days ago we celebrated Passover, Right? The Passover, in verse 4, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Okay, this is amazing. There's so much in this. Passover was the celebration of Exodus. There was a lamb slain and there was blood that covered and the last plague, which was death, passed over. How many of you know the last enemy to be destroyed is death? So the last plague was death and it passed over Israel because of the lamb that was slain. Death had no power. Come on, somebody. So when, when John the Baptist declares in John 1.21, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he's, he's declaring who Jesus is. John recognized who he was. He's come to cover, to give life, and to deliver us from bondage. The second festival is uh, verse 9, and it was the Feast of first fruits. It happens right after Passover. What's significant about that? The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. So after Passover is first fruits, you have the death and the resurrection of Jesus. All of these, these things foreshadow and preach the gospel. All of them testify of the one who was to come. But it says that you, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. Oh, come on. Let me tell you about this. <laughs> in Luke chapter 23, it says that the women, they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And then Luke 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week after Sabbath, the last Adam steps onto a new week, inaugurating a new creation. The first day of a new week, the last Adam donning a new creation so the, the, he's the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. So they were to do this on the day after Sabbath. Do you get that? Come on, somebody. Okay, so the festival of first fruits happens after Passover. And this is what's amazing. When, when they had the Passover, they were to eat unleavened bread. Because one of the imageries for leaven in Scripture is, is sin. But Jesus is the lamb that takes away our... So then you have unleavened bread, meaning it's no longer influenced by the world. 
your sin is removed. He takes it away. And then the third festival we'll get to is, it'll say the Feast of Weeks or uh, um, some call it Shavat, uh, but it's Pentecost. And he says in verse 15, you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Come on, resurrection. Count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, when Jesus rose from the dead. From that day, you sh from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. Why? Seven by seven is 49. So after that day, 49 days, 50 days, you shall count, or seven Sabbaths shall be com completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall wave, you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour and they shall be baked with leaven. So this time you're putting leaven in it. Before the Passover was, was slain, they had unleavened bread, leaven was removed, and now they had, they had first fruits after Sabbath, and then there's Pentecost. And now they're supposed to wave two loaves of leavened bread before the Lord. Why? Because he's come to put a new leaven in us, and it's the Spirit of God. It's the leaven of the kingdom. Now, why did they also do this? Well, because when they left Exodus, when they, when they left Egypt, 50 days later, they were at Mount Sinai. And they climbed the mountain and the Spirit of God came down and they received the law. Now, what does Exodus or Ezekiel 36 say? It says that he's gonna put a new spirit in us. He's gonna put a new heart in us and he's gonna write his law upon our heart. So the Spirit of God comes down to give us a new heart, to put His law in our hearts so that we have, now have a new leaven. Oh, come on. That's amazing. So Pentecost, they're to wave two loaves with leaven. It's the leaven of the kingdom. It, it was all a promise pointing to the fact that God would fill His people with His Spirit. Now, what's significant about that? We, we talked about how the, the kingdom of God is in the spirit of God, right? The, the spirit of God is the ruling power of the kingdom of God. When, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were in an environment that was conducive for the Holy One. They were in an environment where the Holy One and man could dwell together and live together. Man was created to live in the kingdom. What happens, you know, God created everything, right? I heard Apostle Israel share this. It was awesome. He, he talked about how fish, they're designed for a specific environment, right? If you take a fish and you throw it in the air, it's not conducive for the air. Birds are conducive for the air. That, that's the environment they were created for. But fish were designed to swim. By virtue of their nature. Man, what, ha what happens when you take a fish out of water? It dies. Okay, man was designed for the kingdom. What happens when you take man out of the kingdom? Jesus. <laughs> Thanks, Apostle Israel. That was a good word. <laughs> That's so good. But how, how does man live in the kingdom? By the Spirit of God. You won't continue a life in the kingdom if you don't continue a life in the Spirit. Walking with the Spirit, amen? So, this is amazing. In Acts chapter 2, you know, the Lord said in Ezekiel 36, He said, I'm going to gather you from all nations and bring you together, and then I'm going to put a new spirit in you and a new heart. Well, all of Israel was gathered for what? The Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. They had gathered from all around the world. And Acts chapter 2, boom, God comes. And he puts a new spirit in them. Just like he came at Mount Sinai. It says the whole mountain was covered in fire and it shook. Acts chapter 2, it says that tongues of fire filled the house like a mighty rushing wind and the house was shaken. Come on. Man was designed to live in the kingdom. We were designed to live in his presence. 
We were designed to live by the Spirit. Think about a man that, that walks in and by the Spirit like Jesus. <laughs> think about Jesus. Do you think that Jesus is going to live a boring, depressed life? Why? We say because he's Jesus, but, <laughs> but because of the life that he's living, the source by which he lives, the environment in which he lives. Jesus said amazing things like this, where I am, you cannot come. What do you mean? Like, you, I can't walk on the stage? Like, what, what, what do you mean where you are? Where are you? He's like, exactly. <laughs> He'd say amazing things like that. But then he told the disciples in John 17, he said, I pray so that where I am, there you may be also. And that you may behold my glory, which I had before the foundation of the world. So, so then when Jesus dies and resurrects and then ascends, he sends the spirit. And then Paul makes this statement. We have been seated with him in heavenly places. If the Holy Spirit is the ruling power of heaven and he has, he's more powerful than any other power, than any other spirit, and he now lives in you, and he is far above every power thrown in dominion. And he's put his throne inside of you. You know, it says that he's going to make every enemy a footstool for his feet. And that he calls Christ the head of the church. He doesn't call Christ the feet of the church. We are the body of Christ. And he sends the spirit so that every enemy can be put beneath the feet of his bride who's been made one with him. That's a good word. I love what Bill Johnson does. He'll stop and be like, that was a good point, Bill. <laughs> that was a good word, Bradford. <laughs> Jesus came to model something that we were all created for. It says that he partook of flesh and blood so that he could be made exactly like us. So that he would do as a man what we were created to do so he could show us the way and bring us back to our intended purpose. So he came to die to restore us. What did Adam have that he gave away in the garden? Dominion, authority. When, when Satan tempts Jesus, what does he say? He says, all the, these kingdoms of the world, just bow down to me and I'll give them to you. And he says this, for they've been handed over to me. Who handed it over? So Jesus came to undo Adam's failure to restore man so that he could put his spirit back in man, so that then man could do the will of God again. Do you know that that's all throughout the scriptures? You know that God never does anything in the earth unless he first does it through a man. Why? Because he gave the earth to men. Psalm 115 says that the heavens, even the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So when man does something in the domain in which God has given him, that's his, that was man's right to do it. And God won't go back on his word. So if God wants to fix something, he chooses a man. If God wants to change something, he chooses a man to do it through. He didn't just, you know, when, when he reveals himself to Moses, he says, I have come down to deliver my people. Why didn't he just come down in a pillar of fire right in the middle of Egypt? He first goes out into the desert and finds a man because man in, a, in one sense is the doorway into the earth. Why do you think Satan tempts men? 
Because Satan himself needs man's agreement to do things in the earth. That's a good word. So, so all throughout the Bible, you see this where God comes down. He puts his spirit upon someone so that he can do something through that man. We were created to do the will of God by the spirit of God. But all throughout the Old Testament, it was usually only kings and prophets that received the power, the dunamis from on high. And Jesus came to do this amazing thing where he's like, not only will the spirit come upon you, I'm actually going to put the spirit in you. He's going to give you a new heart. Then the spirit's going to come upon you because new wine needs to be put in a new wine skin. And then you won't, you know, be like Samson who just goes back to sin after he does these amazing, it amazes me what some of these guys record. It says the spirit of God would come upon them. And then they would do these amazing things for God. And then like afterwards, you know, they go and sleep with a prostitute. And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> I'm like, ha, like ha, ha, what? How do you be in the spirit? And anyways, so Jesus came to restore men so that, that when he goes, he said, it's better that I leave. Does that ever mess with your mind? It's better that I leave. If I don't leave, then the helper won't come. So Jesus first came to restore men so that then restored men could receive the promise of the Father so they can go and do the will of God and advance the kingdom of God. Amen? Christ, the anointed one, wants to put his anointing upon you, wants to put his anointing upon me. Many of you have it. What are we doing with it? Sometimes we can cry out, God, give us more, give us more, give us more. And he's like, do something with what I've already given you. Be faithful with little and you'll entrust you with much. Come on, somebody. Let's go to, oh, I didn't finish this. I talked about how Dunamis is the inherent power that resides in a thing by virtue of its nature. It's defined as the power for performing miracles. How many of you know Jesus said, the things I do, he who lives and believes in me will do greater things than these. People say, miracles were just for Jesus and the apostles. Well, then why was Stephen, who was a deacon, doing miracles? Why was Samson doing miracles? Why did Moses part the Red Sea and do all these wonders? Why did Joshua? There's all throughout the Bible, every man that partnered with God, God did miracles through them. Everyone. Why did did Enoch get caught up to heaven and never taste death? I don't have an answer for that question. (laughs) There's, There's miracles on every page of the Bible. He's a supernatural God. And, and Jesus said that for those who believe in my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. If you live and believe in me, the works that I do, he will do in greater works than these. Greater works? Really? <laughs> well, you see Paul, them taking, you know, napkins from his clothing or handkerchiefs, people taking them and then waving them over the sick and demonized and they're healed and delivered. Lame walking, blind seeing, demons cast out, just by waving a handkerchief. Bring me the most demonized person, and here, we'll just, just t- t- there you go. Just poof. Just poof. That's amazing. That's called dunamis. That's called power. We need power. How do I know we need power? He said, then you'll be able to be my witnesses. Many people try to be witnesses, but they don't wait for the power. And when we don't witness with power, we just become debaters. And debating never got anyone in the kingdom. That's a fact. That's a good point, Bradford. (laughs) Here's another definition. Moral power. 
moral power, meaning any bondage you've faced or dealt with or struggled with, any sin habit cycle, the Spirit of God gives you power to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness. Moral power and excellence of soul. Here's another definition. This is Strong's Concordance, okay? The power and influence which belongs to riches and wealth. And this is my, the last one of my favorite. The power consisting in or resting upon armies. When the Spirit comes upon you, you receive power. What type of power? The power of an entire army to subdue a nation. The Lord of hosts is with us. What did, what did Elijah pray about Elisha? Lord, we're surrounded by an entire army. What do we do? Lord, just open his eyes to see there's more with us than are with them. There's more with us than are with them. We got to get that. You could never be outnumbered. It's not possible for us to be outnumbered. Sometimes we can be intimidated by various agendas in the world today and think they're gaining prominence and influence. We need to look, lift our eyes to heaven. Oh, wait a second. There's more with us. Oh, go on. Thank you, Jesus. So this, let's, I'm going to go there. We got a little bit of time. First, let's look at this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith, your very faith, is to be in his power, in his dunamis. Sometimes we can say our faith is in the message of the gospel itself. No, your, message, the, your faith is in the one the message points you to. It's faith in Christ. Turn with me to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. In verse two, it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. That alone is crazy. His divine power has given to us all things pertaining of life and godliness who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. We are partakers of a divine nature. You have been born again. You've been born of God. You've been born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. 
We've been made partakers of a divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What? That's amazing. I can escape the corruption of the world? Yeah, it's called the gospel. It's called the good news. I can partake of the divine nature? Yeah, that's called being a son. You've been born of your father. Son means to have the same DNA as. So if you've been born of God and he's now your father, that means you now carry his DNA, his spirit. You've been born of the spirit. Some of y'all got to get excited, man. We need the joy of our salvation. It's called first love. One of the biggest secrets to a life in the spirit, walking in the spirit, growing in the spirit, staying hooked up to the spirit is remembering your first love, abiding in him. That's really what Jesus meant when he said, abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. Remain. The word abide means to remain. It means to refuse to depart. There's no, there's nothing, no distraction the world can offer me that is worth taking my eyes off of the one to whom they belong. Come on, somebody. Let's read this. This is just really good. Fruitful, this, this section here in 2 Peter, verse 5 through 11 is called, it's titled, Fruitful Growth in the Faith. Remember Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll bear much. And by this, my Father will be glorified. We need fruitful growth. Amen? We need power to do that. He, before he gets to this, he emphasizes the fact that his divine power has given to us these things and made us partakers of a divine nature. That's the foundation on which he then says this. Then, now, in light of this, but also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will never be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. Brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. What? For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to burn into the kingdom. I do. I want to stay just in him, him and me, never letting my light grow dim. You know, the priest, God lit the fire in the temple, in the tabernacle, but the priest kept it burning. We do need a fresh Pentecost, but some of us need to rekindle what God already lit. And then we need to keep it burning. And I feel like that's the, the challenge of what God wants to speak to us today is be faithful with what he's given you. There isn't a greater thing he can ever give you than his spirit. There's not a greater gift you can have, not a gift of the spirit that would ever take the place of the spirit. Keep the fire burning. Keep the fire lit. Amen. 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 And by the way, it is, it, it's okay to rest. Sometimes just because, let me, let me put it this way. Just because you don't feel the anointing 24-7 doesn't mean it's not there. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. 
You know, throughout the Old Testament, there were moments, times where the anointed one, let's say, let's take David for example. David was anointed by God when he was a boy. He had been anointed his whole life, right? But there were moments where there was a specific moment where God wanted to do something and the spirit would come upon him and power would be released through him to, to accomplish something for God. Just because you don't feel the spirit on you like that 24 seven doesn't mean you're not anointed. Doesn't mean the fire is not burning. So don't let the devil beat you up with some stupid religious thing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Come on. Let's stand. Close your eyes, we're gonna pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for sending the Parakletos, the helper, the helper that comes to strengthen us in our weaknesses, that comes to intercede for us, to stand beside us, to surround us, to advocate for us, to, to declare the will of God on our behalf. Thank you for the helper who helps us in our weaknesses, who prays for us, who intercedes for us. Thank you for the parakletos. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, right now, we just want to turn our hearts to you in adoration, in worship, in honor of our King who came and conquered our enemies, who came and conquered the grave, who came and conquered our sins, who came and made a way for us to be ransomed from the hand of one that was stronger than us and to then fill us with power so that we could go back and plunder the enemy's camp that once enslaved us. Go ahead and lift your hands. Say, Heavenly Father, fill me again with your spirit and with power and make me a witness make me a vessel of glory of honor to willingly bear the honor of your name and of your kingdom <laughs> say Lord help me Help me to keep the flame of first love burning. And if I've allowed it to go out, Father, forgive me. And would you help me as you help Timothy to rekindle and to stir up the gift of God which is in us. We thank you that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We commit to go forth to do your will until earth looks like heaven. Can I get the ministry team to come forward? If you want just a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to come forward and get prayer from one of these amazing team members of ours up here. And if you just need prayer for anything, you need healing in your body, you need deliverance, you you need to hear from God, you need help hearing God, whatever you need prayer for, I invite you to come forward and receive it now. We would love to pray for you. We'd love to pray with you and, uh, and see the will of God be done in your life. Amen. And any battles you're facing for the power of God to come and move strong on your behalf. Amen. Lift your hands one more time. Father, may you bless your people. May you keep them and may you make your face shine upon them and give them peace. We plead the blood of Jesus over your people. We ask that you surround them in the fire of God 
and give them peace. Let grace be multiplied to them. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.